Hey guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Murders at Teal Woods Manor by Cutlass and Ludius Games. In this game you are going to be playing as a person with interesting objectives. There's going to be three main characters, the uh, host, the investigator, and the murderer. And you're going to have unique objective cards in your hand. And you're going to want certain characters to survive and certain characters to perish throughout the night. Each of the games are going to revolve around six different rounds, starting at seven to eight to nine to 10, 11, and 12 at midnight. And the murderer is going to be moving around this uh, mansion here, this manor. And uh, as the murderer goes around through rooms that have just one other player in it, he will start to kill those players up until the point where the end of the game triggers and the murderer can kill just about anyone on the last round. But note, there's the investigator attempting to try and solve who the murderer is and gaining clue tokens. If you can gain enough clue tokens throughout the game, then the investigator, while alone with the murderer or not alone with the murderer, after six tokens, will be able to defeat the murderer. And if that happens, the game can end. Either way, the game's going to end at the end of the night or if the murderer is perished, and you're going to score points based on what cards you have in your hand. Will you successfully have more points than other players? Find out in the game Murders at Tealwood Manor. Will you survive? To begin the setup of the game, the first thing you will do is you will take the main game board and place it face up, sitting up like this in front of all players so that they can see it. Then you're going to take the roll cards. You'll shuffle the roll cards, which are just all the characters in the game, and then you will randomly place one in each of these locations here. One for the host, one for the investigator, and one for the murderer. After that, you will not need the roll cards anymore, so you can set them aside. Take the main game board and place it out within reach of all players, somewhere in the middle of the table, along with all the different roll tokens. Along with, of course, the main host being face up and everyone else being face down. Uh, then you're going to have these tokens, these like clue tokens. You're going to set them down face down, and these are also used to determine who starts the game off first, so make sure that they're shuffled. They'll have numbers on the back, and you're only going to use them once. Each player are going to get objective cards. You'll shuffle up the objective deck and deal out four objective cards to each player. The objective cards are going to range from a player, like Lionel Ward, dying at the end of the night or by the end of the night, or surviving. And it'll be the same for each character in the game, regardless of its murderer or host or investigator or just one of the many inhabitants of the manor. There are four unique tokens, or I should say reminder cards in the game. The guest list, the two different rooms cards, and the roles, because each of the characters have a different function if they're on the main game board. You'll also have the last player marker that you'll set aside within reach of all players, and these uh, investigation markers. These are the things that you need as the investigator in order to stop the murderer uh, before the end of the night. Otherwise, you can set aside the rest of the stuff, including the rule book, in case you need it for reference. There is some references on the back of the book for the different locations on the game board, and you're pretty much ready to go. To begin the game, the first thing that's going to happen is each player is going to take one of these tokens here, and on the back is a number. And whoever has the highest number is the player who goes first, or lowest if you'd like to mix it up. The last player in that order, so if I got it, and then we had Callie, Josh, and Bill, Bill would be the person with the last player marker. This is a very important marker, which will indicate who plays last during the placement round. And it's also going to be useful because that's the most important portion of the game. Um, Additionally, uh, they're going to move after that for the whoever's the first player marker to the draft phase. The draft phase is pretty simple. You'll have face up and face down tokens depending on who has been revealed and always the host will always remain revealed and you'll be selecting one of these markers. If you choose the host at any point throughout the draft, you are going to gain control of the last player marker. You can simply put it down next to you, but you will not use it until after this draft phase. Otherwise, you can select any other face down character and you will take one of them. And the turn will just simply pass to each player taking a marker, which is actually a character that we put on the main game board. And you will keep doing so until each player receives an equal number of characters from the draft. And in this case here, we have enough to have four for each player. Uh, so this the last character here is just going to go and be put face up or face down in the central bar. Any characters that are not drafted will go to the central bar. And that's pretty much how each draft will go. Select characters until there is an equal number, and then the remaining characters go to the central bar. From there, you'll check to see who has the last player marker and that player will be the last to place. And then in turn order, you will choose one of your characters, 
um, and you will place them down onto the field. Remember, if a character says they are revealed, that was just the draft phase, except for the host. Everybody else has to uh, re reveal the host, but keep the other ones secret. Choose a character and place it in one of the many locations on the game board. You have the lounge, which is going to allow you to gain a clue token and reveal a character on the game board with one of these tokens here. Basically, if you place a character here in the lounge and there is another character somewhere else, you will reveal that character for this specific round and you will gain a clue token, which is one closer to the investigator being able to solve and defeat the murderer. You could choose the billiards room. The billiard room is going to allow you to move any two characters, including the one that you placed, um, and switch them. So if I wanted to, I could take the character I placed here and move it to the lounge and the character from the lounge to the billiards room. The next one here is the kitchen. In the kitchen, you can place a character down and it will be safe from any room abilities. There are certain things that can still affect it, such as the killer being the murderer being in the same location as the character in this room. But for the most part, any type of ability that involves the house will not affect this character. Then you have the central bar. This is going to give you one of these tokens here. You'll take one and you'll also give one to another player that's playing the game. These tokens can be used before you place down a character and you can secretly peek at one of the characters on the game board. The next space is going to be the foyer. The foyer, when you place a character, you can choose any character from the guest list. And if anybody has that character, they must reveal that character for the rest of the round while placement goes. If you do not have that character, then it's obviously somewhere on the game board, either face up or face down. A great way to deduce where characters are, specifically the murderer. Then you have the atrium. The atrium is pretty cool. It's going to let you A, rotate a character from anywhere to the atrium and the character you placed to the location of that character, or if you don't want to, you can choose to take the last player marker. And then finally, you have the library. The library is going to allow you to take, oops, is going to allow you to take any character from anywhere and bring that character to the library. And you'll just simply keep going around the game board, doing certain things, playing certain actions, revealing certain characters, and hopefully gaining some more clue tokens until everybody has placed down all of their tokens or all of their markers, in which case the end of the round will trigger. We'll just say it looks something like this. When the round triggers, all of the tokens are going to be revealed and you're going to check to see what happens, if anything. If a murderer is alone in a room with another player, that player is eliminated. If the murderer is in the room with the investigator, the investigator will perish. However, if you have enough tokens, up to you need to have six, then you can defeat the murderer and the game will end. But otherwise the murderer just kills. However, if the murderer is in a room with more than two people, the murderer and somebody else, the murderer cannot kill anybody. So it's best if you're trying to make the murderer kill people to make sure that the murderer is in separate rooms with just one other person. Don't put them in the central bar if you want the murderer to kill somebody. And then that's pretty much it. The round is going to be over. You'll bring all these tokens that from the revealed markers back. You'll place these guys that were revealed face up for the draft, as well as the host. And then you're going to set all the markers and you'll put them all face down, the ones that were not revealed. And make sure that you go ahead and shuffle them as well so that players do not know what markers are which. So you do a, a little quick magic shuffle here. And then you check to see who has the last player marker and you will start the next round. You'll actually move a marker on this game board here that moves from seven to eight and rinse and repeat, then to nine, 10, 11, and finally 12. And at 12, the game is going to end. But there's one unique difference too. Remember that on the 12th round, at the end of the round, after you flip all these tokens here, wherever the murderer is, the murderer will kill anybody in that room unless the investigator there is there and has six tokens. And that's pretty much it. The game is going to end. You'll flip over your cards and reveal them and be like, I needed Lionel Ward to be murdered. I needed, uh, uh, I needed Senator Lytton to be saved. A A uh, Agatha Jackson to be saved, and I needed Senator Lytton to be murdered. Now, actually, in this case here, it's a good example as well. If at the beginning of the game you have a character that is both dead and alive, you'll actually shuffle them back into the deck so that you can get two new cards, because you're never going to want to have the exact same character for both murdering and not murder. You want to have at least a different character that is either to be murdered or not to be. 
But otherwise, that's pretty much how the game goes. Now, there's a few couple interesting things that can happen as well. Uh, like, for instance, when you place the investigator out, you can actually place him face up in which case something cool can happen. You can reveal another character. Um, there's a, just a few of those little minor things, but otherwise that's how you play the game. Placing down characters, keeping them hidden, trying to get the killer or murderer to be in one of the rooms that you need to murder somebody, or keeping your characters you need to stay alive safe by placing them in locations you know are safe, and utilizing these tokens to get a little bit of information to help you throughout the game. And of course, don't forget the foyer. It's a nice way as well to make sure that players are keeping track of what has been played and what has not been played in the game Murders at Tealwood Manor. Okay, you know how to play the game? Let's talk about it. When I first looked at this game, I originally thought it was kind of going to be a clue-like experience where you're trying to figure out who the murderer is and where they're murdering and all that. It's not like that, actually. This game is more of an area control type of a game. You're going to be trying to figure out, based on memory, where characters have been placed or utilizing your tokens, using special abilities of the characters that you have, trying to get that last player marker to place last because that makes a huge difference in the game. It's very, very powerful to place last because you can change the flow of game and make the murderer do what you want him to do or her as opposed to another player. This game is all about trying to decide what is the best location for the characters that you have. Do you care about the characters that you have? Will you use them as pawns in your scheme to either save or murder other characters? And will you be able to get all of your characters that you want to live safely out and the characters you want to die to be murdered by the murderer? It might not matter to you whether the investigator lives, the host lives, or the murderer dies. That might not be part of your plan at all. Maybe you're simply just trying to kill all of the guests that are unnamed, non-special characters. Or maybe you just want all your characters to survive, including the murderer and the investigator and the host, or the other random characters that are in the game. Each game is also unique in the fact that each of these characters are going to be different, so you're always going to have different characters being the different roles in the game. It really doesn't matter. Each of the rooms has their own unique benefits. The library is a very useful murdering tool that will allow you to place the murderer there and bring another character in. Or it could be a nice safety sanctum where you place a character you know isn't the murderer and bring the character you need to survive into that room, making them kind of locked and safe. However, you have to be careful because the billiard room can rotate characters out. Just when you thought you made the best laid plans, all of a sudden now your character is no longer safe and in a space with an upside down character, you don't know who that is. The atrium has the unique ability of the billiards room, but it's kind of reduced. However, you can choose to take that last player marker, which is going to be very beneficial for you the next round, provided that you can keep it. The lounge. The lounge is where the investigator investigates. It's where they gain those tokens. Once six have been gained by being placed in here, the investigator can now defeat the murderer, ending the game early and maybe successfully accomplishing goals. What's also cool about the investigator is a certain card that says you want the murderer to be dead. If you can successfully do that, where the investigator defeats the murderer, because it's so difficult, it's worth two points instead of one. In general, each of your cards is worth one point in the game, but that's a special one because it's challenging to do. You have the central bar, that's the information uh, station. It's where you're going to be getting these tokens here that you can give to another player. Try and give it to a player who's kind of lower on, on the low end who you think might be suffering in the game. And thusly they can use these tokens and you as well to try and gain some information throughout the game as well. The kitchen. Protection is useful in the game, especially if you don't want your character moved and you know what that character is in there and how you can prevent players from dying. And of course, also remember to forget this, the central bar is very useful in the fact that no one can die there except in the last round, in which case maybe it's not worth placing there if the murderer is still around. The foyer is pretty sweet as well. It will tell you, did somebody already play the murderer? And if so, it must still be on the board somewhere, right? Or maybe it's a character that you need saved and you don't know where that character is. Now you have an idea of where that character is and you can decide on the next turn whether you should use this or not. Each of the spaces on the board provides some unique special ability that will help you gain information throughout the game. I love the fact that there is a top-down type of a board. There's going to be a little ladder staircase that's going to be included here, which will have the tokens that you'll be placing, the clues for the investigator, so you'll know how many are left in the game that you need in order to succeed. There'll be a little round marker here as well. This is a semi-prototype. It's very, very nice quality, but there's some pieces that will be added to the game, obviously, um, and they'll show you what round is being played. All the characters have their own unique feel and whatnot. It was kind of fun. Uh, this is one of our first games. That's why I set up this example, is because these characters all look 
look kind of like they're supposed to in the game. The murderer looks kind of evil. The host looks like it would be a host. And maybe this lady with the, the notebook is the investigator. But that's not the case for any game. It's always going to be a mix-up. And the characters have unique benefits and roles and boons. And it's, it's just a really solid game. It's a very quick, very easy to teach, very easy to understand game. Once you get through the first round, everything else is peachy keen. You might not do so well, specifically if your characters don't go the way they want you want them to, and one character might murder another and thus leave failed to succeed in one department, or if the murderer dies too quickly and you need to kill a bunch of players and you're unable to do so now. Or maybe the murderer just keeps ending up in the central bar, in which case only the last round you have the potential to kill anybody. There's a lot of different random variation throughout this game. It does still have that clue-like feel to it, that them thematic element of moving from room to room and trying to get the murderer in certain spaces. It even kind of actually feels kind of like a murder mystery dinner game, but it's all condensed into a small box game. This is quick. This plays maybe 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes really, and uh, pretty much anybody can play this game once you understand the very basics because most of the stuff, most of the cards in the game, you're not going to use after the very beginning. You're just going to be uh, keeping these objectives throughout the entire game and trying to keep them alive or dead as long as you possibly can. I mean, dead, you want to kill them as soon as you can, and a lot of you want to keep them alive as soon as possible. It's nice too, it has all the guests here, so you don't need to keep track of that. It tells you the roles of how the host, murder, and investigator work, and then all the rooms and their abilities are here on these cards as well. Uh, obviously, I love the idea of trying to control that last player marker because it's so important. There are some cases where even if you're last, you might not be able to control where the murderer murders based on the fact that certain spots have been locked. Once you have all the spaces locked down, you're not able to place on those spaces. You can only place on empty spaces on the game board. So in that case, it might not necessarily help you to be the last player, but for the most part it does. And especially as the game moves forward because a murdered character does not come back. They're gone forever, and whether you want that to happen or not, doesn't matter, it's going to happen. The artwork in the game, beautiful. Excellent. It feels great. The theme feels great. You feel like the murderer is moving around. You're curious as to where they're going, why they're, what, what each player wants to do. Well, it doesn't necessarily affect you most of the time. It can, because maybe all of a sudden your host card who you want to keep alive has now moved into a room that's with a face down character who you don't know that character. And in which case, maybe that player has the card to murder the host while you're trying to keep her alive. So the suspension is, there, the suspense is there in this game. And even though it's light, it has a great thematic feel. Um, I guess some people might not like the idea of having to keep track of things and memory. This has quite a bit of memory, so if you do not like memory games, you probably will not like Murders at Teal Woods Manor. And if you don't like the idea of having to try and keep track of that last player marker, there's a bunch of different ways that, well, there's like three main ways where you can get it. You can get it from getting the host card during the draft, the atrium, and at the very beginning where you uh, flip over the, the, the tiles and that, that will have you go last. And I think there's also one other way as well, but keeping track of that's important because you need to know who's last because they're the one that make the final decision, which usually is very, very important in the game. And sadly, because it's very, very important in the game, sometimes the thing you might be wanting to do will not come to pass if that last player is smart enough to make sure they make the transaction or the placement that's going to make a difference. Overall, though, if you want a light deduction slash memory game with a feel of clue slash like... Uh, this kind of like, a, I guess I mean kind of like a, a werewolf style, like hidden identity type of a game, because you're like kind of hidden as to what your objectives are, then this is a game I strongly suggest you take a look at. Really, really cool. This is a prototype. The cards are a little thin, so hopefully these will get improved. There's pieces that are missing, but I'm sure they're going to be there. This is, like I said, prototype-y. But as long as they make the cards a little thicker and add the extra little pieces to this game, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I do hope they add a little bit more to it so I can see a little bit more replayability with this thing by adding new unique characters and character abilities. Maybe characters with a little star on them that do something unique when you place them or you can place them face up like the investigator has. All of that sounds lovely to me and I like expansion content for these type of games because this one can have quite a bit of it. All right, that's it. If you're interested, take a look at the link in the description. It is a solid fun game. Thank you guys for watching another unfilled to a gamer board game review for the game Murders at Teal Woods Manor. If you're interested, there's a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and pick up this game. If you're also, you would like also to check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, there's a blog post, giveaways, links, and the Kickstarter list as well. We have a live stream on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST where we will be playing this game. And you can also go ahead and check out our live streams on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. PST on Whatnot. 
The rest of the live streams are on all the platforms. You really can't miss us. That's pretty much all I got. Make sure you subscribe if, you've, or if we've earned your subscription. If you watch more than one of our videos here, we do greatly appreciate it. And uh, of course it shows by showing you guys with these, these likes and comments and all that. We know that we're doing the right thing and you guys are enjoying the content. Please leave us any type of comment that you'd like. All right guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to murdering your characters and keeping my characters alive in murders at Teal Woods Manor with you next time.